Good evening, uh, my brothers and sisters at uh, Bethany Chapel. It's um, a great privilege to be able to, to come and open uh, the word of God with you again. I thank you um, again, too, for your flexibility with um, allowing me to, to pre-record these these messages um, as I am as I am able to. Um, I hope that as we open the word of God together, that these times are times of blessing, encouragement, um, and enjoyment as we as we spend time in uh, in His Word. Today we're going to uh, continue just going through uh, some of these early chapters of uh, the book of Hebrews. And if you remember to what we thought about um, on Sunday, we're in some chapters here where the author is providing uh, credentials for uh, God's new method of communication that he spoke about in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Those first four verses of chapter 1 have reminded us that God still speaks. Um, he has always communicated. He has communicated to us as his created beings. And therefore, given that he is create, he has he is communicating to us in our language, is showing us that he wants to be made known. And his new method of communication at this point in time, it is not through the prophets as it has been for these readers in many years past, but it is through his son, the Lord Jesus. And Christ is not just the messenger, but he is also the message that God has for us. And so as we enter this book, the author is going to take some time to provide credentials for the Lord Jesus as to why we should be paying attention to what he has to say. And in chapters one and two, we thought of on Sunday, he uses a comparison between Christ and angels to show how Christ is so much better than angels. Why and how is the Lord Jesus so much better than the angels? Well, he is because God has given him a better position. God has exalted him above everything that has been created and he all, he occupies that position because he was given it, but he has also accomplished more than angels and is therefore proved that that position is rightfully his. Today, we are going to move this evening, we are going to move down into chapters three and four of Hebrews, and we are going to see the writer present um, two other elements uh, in this, the first is that Jesus is God, and that because he is God, it makes him better, not only than Moses, as we are presented here, but also better than everyone else. We are going to start reading today, uh, actually, I'm going to just start at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you, please, uh, to turn to that verse so we can uh, crack on with our reading here. Uh, we are going to read from chapters uh, from chapter 2, 17 through to the end of uh, chapter 4. And as we do so, I would like to uh, invite you to observe two things as we read, pay attention to them as we, we read them. Uh, we are reading 37 verses, and in these 37 verses, the word therefore occurs eight times. Uh, we are excluding in that count of eight, chapter three, verse 10. Uh, it does say the word therefore, but it's taken from a quote. Um, but these other eight references and usage of the word therefore is a building block in the author's argument through these verses. He builds and he builds and he builds. And the therefores are, okay, because of this layer, then we have this one. And because of that, this layer, we then have that one. And so you see the argument build and build and build and build and build as we get through the chapter. The second thing I would invite you to observe is actually the way that the author constructs his argument, not just on the building blocks of the therefores, but there are three elements to the presentation that he has. Number one is that he presents the credential that he wants the readers to pay attention to and the proof that it is true. He then presents a warning and or an exhortation to the reader and then gives the reason or multiple reasons why they should heed that warning and that warning ties back into the credential 
that was presented of the Lord Jesus. He did a very similar thing, or actually exactly the same thing in chapters 1 and 2, where he presents the credential of the Lord in chapter 1, verse 4, in saying that he is so much better than angels, and how that because he is better, therefore his communication is superior. The warning that he gives is that we take care not to drift away from it, and that how on earth would we expect to escape if we do neglect what Christ is communicating to us? And the reasons why that they should heed this warning was the the 10 things that we listed out um, at the end of our service on, on Sunday of how Christ was made for a little while lower than the angels and what he did as a result of that or being in that position. But that is what gives Christ's credentials weight and meaning. So let's look at these two things as we as we go through. We are going to spend some time unpacking these verses together. But for right now, we're going to read the word of God. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. The writer says, therefore, he, that is the Lord Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for well, since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways as I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore let us fear... If while a promise remains of entering his rest, that any of you may seem to have come short for, from it, short of it. But indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished, from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. 
so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Man, there is a lot of stuff packed into those verses. Just as I said on, on Sunday, I don't mean to, to do them a disservice by not d- diving into the detail, but I'd really like us to get an idea of the flow of the passage, the intention of the author in what he is presenting in these words. After he has presented Christ in chapters 1 and 2 as being better than angels, he invites the readers, he invites us, to pause. Pause, and on the basis of what he has just said, he says, therefore, so on the basis of everything else, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, do this. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. Take time to look at him. Take time to think about him. Do not let anything else get in the way. Consider Jesus. Not a quick look, not a passing glance, but a detailed examination, a detailed study, a detailed look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. He is the apostle and the high priest of our faith. But above this, above all else, he was faithful. He had been appointed to a position and for a task, and he was faithful in doing it, just as Moses had been in bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt and to the border of the promised land, This is the example that the Lord Jesus is going to be compared to. Moses was faithful just, I would say Christ was faithful just as Moses was faithful. But the author says this, but, and here is the difference between the two, Christ is worthy of more glory than Moses. It is not that he has more glory, he does, but it's that he is worthy of more glory. He is deserving of more glory than Moses. Moses was a tremendously significant individual to the uh, the people of Israel. And just as we we thought of the warning um, on Sunday about angels, maybe he, to some of the readers, had been put into an incorrect position in their lives, where he was held with more glory, with more honor, and more worthy of glory than the Lord Jesus. But the writer is going to go on and say that, yes, he is worthy of more glory. And there's an there's a analogy that he now makes to a builder of a house, how that builder receives more honor than the house itself. The scale and impressiveness of the house is not due to the elements that make up that house. Every single one of those elements, if you have gone past a building site recently for a house, every single one of those elements is deposited on that building site, usually by a truck. And they come on skids and they come on pallets or they come in all sorts of boxes and different forms. And they sit there until a builder comes along and does something with them. And the impressiveness in the final product that is made, that is lived in, is due to the builder, not the materials. Now, within reason, 
any one of us could build a house. We may not have confidence in the house that we build being livable or inhabitable, but within reason, any one of us could build a house. The author, though, is very uh, direct here and says, you know, Moses built, could build a house, but actually everything is built by God. And the, the line that is drawn is here is that if, if Christ is worthy of more honor than Moses, as Christ has the honor of the builder, because Moses was faithful in the house, not in building the house, as Christ has more honor than the builder, he is actually God, for God makes all things. The position of the creator, the position of the builder belongs to God, and therefore Christ is God. In what God was doing, in what God's intention were and purposes were with the children of Israel, Moses was faithful. But Moses was faithful, we see, as a servant. Uh, that's first number, that's first number five, if you're looking down for it. Moses was faithful as a servant. This was his sphere of faithfulness. He followed commands and did his duty and did his work. But he did not have a creative stake, if we put it that way, in what God was doing. He was following the instructions of God, of the builder. Now, he did so, whether he was aware of it or not, he did so so that his actions might point forward to a perfect fulfillment. Okay? Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken of later. Moses' actions point forward to Christ, who was also faithful, but now he wasn't faithful as a servant, but he was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. This was a position and a name that was given to him by God the Father. You remember that back from chapter one. He was given a more excellent name than the angels, and that position demonstrates that he is God, and therefore that position also indicates that he is so much better than Moses, and really by extension that he is so much better than everyone else, despite what our pride and arrogance might try to convince us of otherwise. Today, we are Christ's house. We are or the church is his building, as we read in other epistles, the building of which he is the chief cornerstone of. He died to redeem us to God, and one day he is going to present us clothed in his righteousness, and he has a position of authority over the church. All accountability goes to him. It is a position that is rightfully and worthily his. In verse number seven, after having presented these facts, after having made this argument, the author is going to change focus. Okay, and he is going to point back into history again to present a danger to the readers. Just as he had pointed back to Moses to compare Christ to, he is going to do the same thing, but to a different example. So in light of what he just says, he warns the readers to be careful of not hardening their hearts. So in light of the fact that Christ has been presented as God, in light of the fact that he has a position of power, and in light of the fact that Christ has the rightful authority that goes on, or that goes with that position, he says to them, do not harden your hearts. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. It is the evil and unbelieving heart that causes them to fall away from God. The inclusion of the word unbelieving is interesting. It can ask us, it can cause us to ask the question, do we believe that Christ is the greatest? Do we believe that Christ is the person who has all authority over our lives and lives around us? Again, just as we thought last week, we might give mental assent to that, but our lives might very well betray us. Do we believe that Christ is 
the greatest because our hearts can be hardened um, as he says at the end of verse number 13 our hearts can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin deceits deceitfulness not really words you find used very often today being deceitful is misrepresenting the truth and so the devil is going to be very quick this is what the devil does frequently is misrepresenting the truth and that is what is causing hearts to be hardened and so the example that is presented is from how the children of Israel hardened their hearts in the wilderness uh, which prevented them from entering into the blessing into the rest that God had for them they listened to the report of the spies coming back from the land of Canaan and they allowed or sin misrepresented the truth and caused their hearts to be hardened. And so for 40 years, they spent their time in the wilderness. Their bodies fell. Those people never entered their rest. The only two which did were Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who were faithful to what they had seen and were faithful to their God. And so we are going to move into chapter four with more and more layers being built onto this warning and this reason why the people or the audience, the readers, why we should pay attention to this warning. Verse number four, sorry, chapter four, verse number one, excuse my, my misstatement. It starts starts with this. If if this was the reality before, if this was the reality that the children of Israel hardened their hearts and could not enter into the rest, could not enter into the blessing that God has for them, then really we should fear. We should be afraid that if there is a promise of being able to enter into the rest from God, if there is a promise of being able to enter into and enjoy the blessings from God, we should fear that we do not do so. We should be afraid that if our hearts are hardened, that they will keep us from entering into the rest and the blessings that God has for us. Now, this is one of the realities that we have as believers. We may be saved and we believe that nothing can change our salvation. We cannot lose it. Whoever comes to Christ, he will in no wise cast out. But while we may be saved, there is a very real reality that we might not fully enter into the rest and the blessing, if we call it blessing, that God has for us. How tremendously sad is that when we think of what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, is that he came that we might have life, that we have been saved from lives of death and destruction, but that we might not only have life, not only have eternal life, but life now that is meant and intended to be abundant we have had good news preached to us but we also the author says must have faith in god and so therefore if there is a rest if there is a reality that we might not be able to enter fully into the rest that god has for us we should be afraid we should look at this example that the that that is made of the the children of Israel and be very take very seriously anything that might harden our hearts and prevent us from entering into the rest and blessing that God has for us. And another layer comes in verse six of this chapter. If we allow our hearts to be hardened, we will not fully enter the rest and blessing that God has for us that should cause us to be afraid. But it doesn't mean that the opportunity to enter that rest has gone away. Notice this. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. The children of Israel may have failed to enter because of their disobedience. They failed to enter because they allowed their hearts and uh, their hearts to be hardened. But the opportunity, if you look at verse number eight, the opportunity still existed generations later when David wrote. But the writer says, if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. 
And it still remains available when Hebrews was written, verse number nine, says it very emphatically. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This is the reality of the rest. This is the reality of the blessing that Christ has for us is that we cease from our works. The people who are reading this letter would have been very familiar with what a Sabbath day was and the rest that came, the rest that was intended by God in that Sabbath rest. And so there, there, there remains an opportunity. There remains ability to enter into the rest, to enter into the blessings that God has for every one of us. More layers come in verse number 11. Let's look at that. We can run the risk of not being able to enter into the blessing of God if our hearts are hardened. It doesn't mean that we lose the opportunity to enter. So if the opportunity is there, what should we do? On the basis of everything that, that the writer has just taught, we should be diligent to find it. We should be diligent who find it. Don't be like those who are remembered because of their disobedience. This is not like this is not the example to follow is what the writer says in verse number 11. Don't be like those people. But here is what we need to do. We need to examine our hearts. But this is the crux of the issue. If it is our hearts that are going to be hardened and our hardened hearts that will prevent us from fully entering into all of the rest and the blessing that God has for us, it is our hearts that must be examined. And there is nothing better than the word of God to do this. This is the context which this verse comes in. This is, you know, we often will quote this verse as the power of the word of God. And, it, and I do not mean to detract from that at all. But in the examination of our individual hearts, the tool that we use is the word of God, for it is alive. It is active. It is able to do. It, it is able to do what God intends it to do. It brings everything out into the open and it distinguishes between things that we cannot. It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. That one for the readers at this time was not distinguishable. Now through technology, we can tell the difference between joints and marrow. But this is the point that the writer is throwing. You, can you distinguish between soul and spirit? Can you distinguish between joints and marrow? Can you judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart? Can you distinguish between those two? The word of God can. And the word of God will. It is what we must examine ourselves and it will show us what to do, where to take action. But the reality is, is that as we examine ourselves in light of the word of God, we should be prepared for a very, very ugly assessment. If we are examining hearts that are in any way hardened, it is a guarantee that we will find disgusting, ugly, sin-stained, sin-mutated elements to our hardened hearts that is causing us to fall away from God. But it is a necessary examination. There is no creature hidden from the Lord's sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. But for us, we need to examine ourselves. And when we realize what our hearts are truly like, when we realize how they have been mutated, how they have been manipulated, how they have been deceived by the deceitfulness of sin, what is it that we do next? To a very orthodox Jew or a very religious Jew, a devout Jew, they would have been very used to presenting themselves to the priest when they needed, when they needed cleansing. If they had touched a dead animal or a, or a dead body, or they had become unclean in any one of the ways outlined in the law, they knew what they had to do to be clean. This is what the Lord or the Lord tells us through the writer here is that we are to hold fast to our confession. Hold fast to our confession. He, this is where these two chapters come in full circle. Remember, we had that word confession right at the start of chapter three, that he was the high priest 
of our confession. If we have confessed the Lord Jesus of Lord, let's actually own him as Lord, shall we? Let's actually live as if he is Lord of our lives. We don't like the idea of Lordship much these days. It flies in the face of, of everything the culture would tell us about how we are able and entitled to do anything we want whenever we want. But let's actually treat the Lord Jesus as Lord of our lives, shall we, if that is what we have confessed to? We go to him as Lord in this scenario. The Jews, they would have gone to a priest. And actually the same is true for us. that We don't go to a physical priest or even to a high priest, but our Lord Jesus Christ exists for us as a great high priest. Verse number 14. So if we have examined ourselves on the basis of the examination that we have done by the, the word of God and knowing that everything is laid bare before the Lord Jesus, on the basis of that, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. He has entered into heaven for us. He has gone in for us as a forerunner who has opened the way that we might be able to follow. He is the one, if you remember back to, to verse 17 of chapter 2 that we read, he was made like us so that he might be merciful and faithful. He has experienced all of the temptations of sin that harden our hearts like we have experienced. He is the one who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but he is one who is perfect. The sin that he was tempted with, the sin that we are tempted with in the same way, he did not yield to it. He, he, the greatest temptation that we have ever had to sin, he has experienced and more and never gave in to it. It is amazing to be able to come to such a one as this. It is amazing to think that he is not an austere or a harsh overlord, but that he is sympathetic, that he is merciful to us. And this is not, this is the one who, who we come to, but then where do we actually meet him? This is the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful verses, I think, in all of our Bible, verse number 16. Let us draw near with confidence, confidence not in us, confidence in the one who has just been presented to us in verses 14 and 15. We draw near with confidence in him to the throne of grace. We come not to a throne of judgment. We come not to a throne of punishment. We come to a throne whose very characteristic is to give that which we do not deserve. It is a place where mercy and grace is ready to be poured out when we are in need. Come near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As you will go to prayer here in a few minutes, I know that there are many needs undoubtedly in your assembly that need to be presented. I have no idea the details of what is happening in every single one of your lives, and I do not mean to minimize the significance of it. However, I would point out that the deceitfulness of sin leading to a hardened heart is something that should be taken very, very seriously. And it is wonderful that we can come to Christ at a throne of grace whenever we need to. But it is even more wonderful to know that in times of need when we come, when we recognize how far short we have fallen, how far and to the extent that we have been deceived, let us draw near now in prayer with confidence to him or in him, knowing that the, the throne to which we come is one where grace and mercy are given lavishly for all who need it. And let's be honest, we all need it. Thank you. My God and Father, I just paused again today and I thank you for your son. 
I thank you that he is in heaven for us, that he has gone ahead of us into your presence. He has made a way for all of us to enter there one day. And I praise you. I praise you for your goodness, your blessing and your kindness to us that has been shown and that we receive as we draw near to you at a throne of grace. Oh God, I pray that we would not be deceived by sin. I pray that we would examine ourselves according to the truth of your word and that, Lord, if there has been deception take place, if there has been hardening of our hearts, oh God, help us, give us grace and mercy to be able to address it, I pray. Father God, I thank you that you have this desire for us. I thank you that you have a desire to see us sanctified and made more into the image of your son. Help us not to shirk away from that as painful as it might be at times. And we pray that all of this will be done for your honour, for your glory, and for the blessing of your people. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all once again uh, for the opportunity to, to come and to minister to you. And I pray you have a wonderful time in prayer for the rest of your evening. Bye-bye.